Uh, this topic as a whole is, has just so many different threads and they're all kind of knotted together. And uh, what I'd like to do this morning is uh, just pull on a couple of those threads and just see if we can un unravel just a few pieces to it. Some of them you may be familiar with, others uh, you may not, but I uh, just want to start with that. The topic for me is actually a very personal one. Uh, I am the son of German immigrants who came to Canada in the aftermath of the Second World War. And some of my early memories are of my grandparents talking about their experiences during the war. And towards the end of the war, uh, Germany was running out of men who were capable of uh, fighting, and my grandfather's name came up in the, on the roster of draftees. Uh, until that point, uh, my grandfather had been a, uh, a manager at a small toy factory, and uh, his name came up, and so he was thrust into the role of a quartermaster in the German army at the age of 45, which is significantly older than what most folks normally start at. Uh, he was captured and uh, spent significant time in a Russian prisoner of war camp. Uh, he was released um, by the Russians uh, several years after the end of the war and primarily due to some significant um, health concerns that he developed while at the um, uh, POW camp. Um, my great-grandfather and my great-aunt were killed during an Allied bombing run over the city of Hanover. And so uh, my um, grandparents' experiences taught me about the devastation and the havoc that is created by war. And those stories lie in the background to my reading of the biblical text. And then when that's coupled with the lens of the Hague and Geneva Conventions, they raise questions for me about how to read biblical war texts, particularly those found in Deuteronomy and Joshua that describe the total kill of the Canaanites. Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 and 2 emphasize that when the Israelites came into, come into the land, they are told to utterly destroy the Canaanites, make no covenant with them, and show them no mercy. Uh, Deuteronomy 16, or 20, verses 16 to 17 say, But as for the towns of these people that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them. And when we read uh, the books of Joshua and, and following, it seems like the Israelites end up doing exactly that. They end up trying to at least wipe out the Canaanites. In the first battle, which in many conquest accounts is paradigmatic, the narrator describes how uh, the, the Israelites destroy Jericho and he uses the language of complete destruction. We read in Joshua 6, verse 21, Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. Similarly, in Joshua 10, uh, we read about a series of Israelite victories, and we're told, for example, I'm just picking one of a number here, but in uh, verse 37 we read, And they took it, which is uh, the city of Hebron, and they struck it to the, sword, to the edge of the sword, and its king, and its towns, and every person in it. He left no one remaining in it, just as he had done to Eglon, and utterly destroyed it with every person in it. Similarly, the narrative summary of Joshua's conquest activities uh, says that Joshua did all of this according to Yahweh and Moses' words, as the Lord commanded his servant Moses. So Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all the Lord commanded Moses. And then we could add into some of these texts, other texts in Samuel and Kings and move even beyond that to the prophets, but I want to focus largely on, on these texts and I think these texts, as Marion already alluded to, raise all kinds of questions that are complex. And the tentacles of those questions go out in a variety of different directions. They're theological, they're apologetic, they're exegetical, uh, 
um, and, and they're ethical. Uh, and so, as I said, I just want to tug on a couple of those threads this morning and, uh, and just look at ways, uh, possible ways that we might read some of what happens in the biblical text re- redemptively. But first, uh, let me just uh, point us to a couple of past solutions for how to read these texts. Uh, one approach, which uh, is typified by uh, Marcion and has been picked up on by a significant amount of other readers, um, maybe most, most recently would be C.S. Cowles in a Four, four Views book show, uh, titled Show Them No Mercy. And essentially their solution to the problem is to say that uh, that's just the Old Testament God being the Old Testament God. Now, the God that we meet in the New Testament is a God of love, has nothing to do with the God of the Old Testament. However, I I find that approach unsatisfying for a wide variety of different reasons. Uh, The Old Testament says much about the love and the grace of God. I keep telling my students that, and I think eventually they catch on. The New Testament has much to say about God's judgment. And then uh, Jesus and the New Testament writers also do not seem to be embarrassed by uh, the Old Testament stories. And so I, I don't find that solution particularly helpful. A second response is that the, the words in Deuteronomy and Joshua really don't mean what they say. They point us maybe in a different or maybe a deeper direction. Uh, so Origen wrote about the slaughter of the entire population of the city of Ai. You will read in the Holy Scriptures about the battles of the just ones, about the slaughter and carnage of murders that the saints spare none of their deeply rooted enemies. If they do spare them, they are even charged with sin, just as Saul was charged because he had preserved the life of Agag, king of Amalek. You should understand the wars of the just by the method I set forth above, that these wars are waged by them against sin. But how will the just ones endure if they, re- if they reserve even a little bit of sin? Therefore, this is what is said of them. They did not leave behind anyone who might, have, might be saved or might escape. And so essentially, Origen indicates that the way to deal with difficult Old Testament passages like this is to suggest that they, they, the words don't really mean what they say. They point us to the deeper realities of spiritual warfare. But Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7 uh, seems to assume uh, at least something happened, that there's more than just a spiritual battle going on. A third approach is uh, that the events are are not historical. Uh, So work by a a wide variety of recent scholars, among them are Douglas Earle and Eric Siebert, have suggested that the stories that we find in the book of Joshua are foundation stories. They are Israel's myths that are retrojected back onto Israel's history. And again, I don't find this solution to be viable either. Um, Even if we grant that none of the texts are historical and have any basis in um, history, I don't think that solves our problem because that still leaves a theological problem of the character of God, a God who is... uh, characterized or portrayed as commissioning what today we would call a genocide. Secondly, the texts that describe the annihilation of the Canaanites become part of Israel's collective memory, and as such, they can still engender genocidal actions. Uh, we learned that in, uh, by looking at what happens in, or what happened in Rwanda, for example. And there are a whole bunch of other solutions. Uh, Some of them are more helpful than others. Um, I don't think that there is one kind of silver bullet, one answer that kind of solves absolutely everything. But I do think that there are a few things that can be helpful and maybe even redemptive as we read these difficult texts. And so I want to examine just a few of those elements as we uh, reflect today. One of the factors that I'd like to focus on is uh, to read the biblical text within its larger ancient Near Eastern context. Uh, 
Ancient Israel shared not only its experience of military conflict with its neighbors, but also the use of similar weapons, strategies, tactics, and even beliefs about the right conduct of war. A seminal work by K. Lawson Younger, uh, nearly 30 years ago now, compares warfare in the Bible with ancient Near Eastern warfare and found a, uh, and he focused specifically in the terms of the biblical text on Joshua, uh, Joshua 9 through 12, but he found that there was a significant degree of overlap between the way that ancient peoples talked about or described their battles. And one of the ways that kings in the ancient Near East would showcase their military prowess and success to their publics was to inscribe their accomplishments for public display in temples, on palace walls, or on erected stones called stele. These inscriptions enshrined the military conquests and exploits of ancient kings presenting their accomplishments in the best possible light often and they often made use of hyperbole. Hyperbole is a common literary and rhetorical device that uses emotionally charged overstatement to persuade an audience of a particular point. And ancient Near Eastern scribes made generous use of hyperbole uh, in describing ancient war exploits. And so I'd like to look at a, a few examples of that. Um, one example is in the Egyptian account of the Battle of Kadesh, which is an epic battle between the two superpowers of the time, the Egyptians and the Hittites. And Ramses II's account of the battle highlights his bravery and suggests an overwhelming Egyptian victory. Uh, he writes this, he says, I found that the 2,500 chariots in whose midst I was they all fell prostrate before my horses. None of them were able to fight. Their hearts quailed in their bodies through fear of me. All their arms were weak, they could not shoot. They could not steady their minds to seize their javelins. I made them plunge into the waters as crocodiles plunge so that they fell on their faces one on top of another. I slaughtered them just as I wished. None looked behind him, no other turned around. Whoever of them fell, he did not rise again. And if you read Ramses' account of the battle, it sounds like the Egyptians skunked the Hittites. And yes, the Hittites do seem to suffer significant losses, but most scholars acknowledge that the battle likely resulted in a draw in actuality. Ramses was unable to capture Kadesh, which remained in Hittite control. Uh, his Hittite opponent, Muwatali, harried the Egyptians as they fled after the battle, and even take, taken control of the Egyptian-held city of Upi, or Damascus, for a year's time. Additionally, Amuru, an Egyptian ally up to that point, came under Hittite control after the battle. These are not the actions of a decisively defeated army. And so while not totally falsifying his accomplishments, Ramses' portrait of the Battle of Kadesh paints, let's call it an excessively rosy picture of what actually transpired. Similarly, um, King Seti I uh, says upon his triumph in his, or his triumphant return to Egypt after a series of northern wars, he says, His majesty slew them all at once. He leaves no heirs among them. Whoever escapes his hand, though, is but a prisoner brought to the Nile. And in this case, as said, he claims to have left no heirs among his enemies to completely have destroyed them. And yet in the next sentence, he allows that some escaped and were brought back as prisoner to Egypt. The Assyrian king, Tiglath-Pileser, says that he decisively defeated the Alamu Arameans, chasing them across the Euphrates River 28 times, including twice in one year which doesn't sound very decisive if it's a defeat. Um, 
probably the most well-known uh, example, or one of the well-known examples from the ancient Near East, a pharaoh Merneptah describes his battles in the Levant, and at one point he says, Yanom is made into non-existence, Israel is wasted, its seed is not. And the idiom, its seed is not, conveys the idea that no offspring remain, that no survivor was left to carry on the name of Israel. And while likely describing a battle that took place that was not recorded in the Bible, the idea that no Israelite survived Pharaoh Merneptah is clearly an exaggerated claim. And so hyperbole seems to play an integral part of ancient Near Eastern war rhetoric. The ancient world thought about and talked about warfare in an array of language that went well beyond what actually happened in order to communicate not only the military action itself, but the emotive perspective behind that of what took place. Ancient scribes could relate the complete annihilation of the enemy, while later history shows that this was not the case. Even the same battle accounts acknowledge at times the presence of survivors, and so ancient battle reportage at times claimed the conquest or control of entire regions or people groups when other data indicates that victory was not as complete as described. I want to suggest to you that the biblical text also evidences hyperbole and that I think the best answer that I've found for uh, wrestling through these war texts is that there is an element of hyperbole that's involved. In Joshua 10 verses, uh, verses 11, uh, or 41 to 42 sorry, say that Joshua conquered all of the territory of the Philistines, but then in chapter 11, verse 21 and 22, it says that there are still Anakites living in an area that the Israelites are said to conquer. And even after that, uh, Joshua 13, verse 2, talks about how the, the entire region of the Philistines still needs to be conquered. Joshua 10, verses 38 and 39, indicate that Israel put all of the city of Debir to the sword. They totally destroyed the town. And yet, just a few chapters later, Caleb is warring against the city of Debir. How can Caleb conquer a city that has already been completely annihilated? In a summary of Israel's conquest activities in Joshua 11, verses 16 and 17, we're told that Joshua took the entire land. Joshua 21, verses 44 to 45 Uh, say that uh, Joshua took the entire land, that none of Israel's enemies withstood them because God gave all into their hands. And yet when you turn the page and we get to Judges chapter 1 verse 1, we read that the Israelites, after Joshua passes away, that the Israelites go and ask who of us should go up first to fight the Canaanites. And as careful readers of scripture, we should be asking what Canaanites? Where did they come from? In Jeremiah 25, verse 9, uh, we read uh, Yahweh saying that he will completely destroy the people of Judah through Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and take the entire land, uh, or leave the entire land as, quote, an everlasting desolation. And yet people continue to live on the land, and once we get to the post-exilic books, we find that people come back and live on the everlasting desolation. And so I suggest that like ancient Near Eastern battle accounts, the Bible also uses hyperbole to describe Israel's battles in the land of Canaan. Battles were fought. There were casualties, indeed. But this is the way that ancient writers wrote about their wars of conquest. And so the writer of the book of Joshua is not necessarily trying to say that Israel fully conquered all Canaan to the exclusion of all else. Nor does the total kill language necessarily mean the mass slaughter of everyone in a city. Rather, hyperbole 
is a legitimate way of expressing the broad scope and sequence of conquest using methods common to the ancient Near East and was a way of expressing the greatness in the Israelites' case of the work of God. And it's interesting because we continue to use hyperbole uh, in the arena of uh, sports. And so, for example, I might be... um, when I wake up in the morning, if I want to catch up on the morning sports or on the morning news, I might tune in to City TV here in Toronto. And uh, Kevin Frankish might be reading the news and he might say that the Islamic forces in northern Nigeria slaughtered 25 villagers, including women and children. And I would rightly be grieved by that, profoundly grieved. However, just a little bit later, maybe a minute or two later, in the same show, but now in a sports cast, Kevin Frankish might say that the Winnipeg Jets slaughtered the Toronto Maple Leafs. This year it should be a good, it should be a good battle to see who comes out on top. But instinctively, we as moderns know to distinguish between what Kevin Frankish said just a few minutes before when he talked about the slaughter of an entire village and here when he talks about the slaughter of the Toronto Maple Leafs. We know that there aren't six bodies lying on the ice or however many bodies lying on the ice and that the next night they've got to find six more live bodies to throw out there. We know how to interpret that kind of language but when it comes to the biblical text... We, we often in the past haven't made use of or become aware of the use of hyperbole to describe what's going on in the biblical conquest accounts. And so I think by recognizing the use of hyperbole, uh, that doesn't solve uh, the problem. It doesn't solve the ethical questions that lie behind the conquest, but I think it does help us in a couple of ways. First of all, it does um, reduce the severity of what happened. Not everyone was killed in Israel's battles against the Canaanites, contrary to what the rhetoric of the text might say. Secondly, I think what it does is it also provides us an ethical baseline within the ancient Near Eastern world. The comparison gives us a starting place for understanding normal war expectations and descriptions. Israel used total kill language to describe its warfare practices, just as others in the ancient Near East did. And such a baseline allows us to see what might be redemptive when it comes to Israel's war practices. Let me pull on a a second thread as we think about um, reading the biblical war text. And one of uh, the other better answers that uh, doesn't get much airtime when it comes to discussions about the problem of what do we do with Joshua and the Canaanites is that there is a second method of uh, gaining control over the promised land, and that is the driving out of the Canaanites. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 and 30, place drive out and total kill language side by side. Deuteronomy 12 says, When the Lord your God has cut off before you, um, before you the nations that you were about to enter to dispossess them, when you have dispossessed them and live in the land, take care that you are not ensnared into imitating them after they have been destroyed before you. Similarly, um, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 uh, say, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, uh, when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must destroy them, or utterly destroy them. And so these passages place uh, drive-out language and total kill language side by side. However, there are numerous other passages that talk about what Israel is to do and what Israel does in the land of Canaan without mentioning total kill uh, in any way. 
Deuteronomy 4, 37 to 38 says uh, that he brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than yourselves. In other, uh, other examples, we see that uh, in some passages, God himself says that he will drive out the, enemy, the enemies, indicating that the expelling of the Canaanites could be thought of independent of total kill actions. And at other times, the Israelites receive explicit instructions to drive out the Canaanites with no mention of killing them. Furthermore, after the fact battle reports of what happened frequently speak of Israel driving the Canaanites out of the land without any mention of killing. And finally, uh, forward-looking mid-battle conquest reports of what Israel still needed to do focus exclusively on driving the Canaanites out of the land with no mention of killing. Of course, some degree of killing may or may not have happened alongside of the driving out of the Canaanites. The point here is that the biblical text often places primary and sometimes exclusive focus on driving the Canaanites out of the land. Driving out was a legitimate or acceptable war method by itself at times and also in conjunction with killing. Uh, Either of these options in a cumulative effort would accomplish the goal of establishing a new Eden and sacred space that that included the exclusive worship of Yahweh on Yahweh's land. In this light, the goal of Israel's battles within the land of Canaan from an ancient, ancient Israelite perspective was not necessarily the destruction of the Canaanites per se, or today we might say genocide. Rather, the focus is upon claiming, or maybe reclaiming, sanctuary lands and, create, and to create the conditions for the exclusive worship of Yahweh. Again, that doesn't solve the problem, but it helps to ameliorate it just a bit. A third helpful answer, I I think, is to look at the uneasy war God that we find in the Old Testament. Since many biblical war texts depict Yahweh's participation with Israel in warfare in a seemingly positive light, readers can conclude that Yahweh accepts Israel's warfare without reservation, commends it, and perhaps is even fond of their bloody battles, much like ancient Near Eastern gods. But when we look more closely, this is not the case. A collection of anti-war, or we can call them subversive war texts in scripture, tell a different story. These biblical texts expose our faulty perceptions of Yahweh because they present Yahweh as an uneasy or highly reluctant war god. And in our remaining time, I'd like to look just briefly at some of these subversive war texts. One of the places where we catch a glimpse of Israel's God as an uneasy war God is when we once again compare Israel's practices with those of her neighbors. And one common theme in the description of ancient warfare includes the connection between victory in battle and the building of a temple, or the restoration of a temple in some cases. In short, uh, the ancient Near Eastern world followed a standard three-step pattern, battle, build, and boast. A king who fought a victorious battle would then build a temple for his god, on which or in which the king would then boast about his triumph by commissioning artists to memorialize that battle in the temple or sometimes on palace walls. Egyptian iconography includes war scenes that range from the benign, uh, such as um, uh, Amun-Re receiving the list of cities and villages that are captured by Shoshank I, to much more graphic uh, depictions. The tower entrance to the mortuary temple of Ramses III at Medina Tabu includes a gigantic depiction of Ramses smiting captives with a mace. There we go. Uh, while holding them up by, his, by their hair with the god uh, Amun watching as this happens. 
uh, even more gruesome, is a depiction on the northern wall of the temple that shows piles of severed hands. Uh, there's another depiction which I didn't show you, uh, which also includes a pile of um, penises. And they total 3,000, according to an accompanying inscription. In Mesopotamia, in the Enuma Elish, uh, there's a strong connection between battle and temple building and maybe boasting. Uh, when the god Marduk establishes his house or temple shortly after defeating Tiamat. And then it's recorded in the Enuma Elish. After uh, defeating an enemy coalition, Yadun Lim, the king of Mari, inscribed on the temple of Shamash how he heaped up their dead bodies. And then he goes on to describe how he builds the temple of Shamash. The cylinder inscription of Sargon II boasts about, having, uh, about his rule as having no princes equal to him who has smashed all lands like pots. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, famous uh, for conquering and destroying the city of uh, Jerusalem, fought the Egyptian army in the battle of Kadesh. Uh, sorry, in the Battle of Carchemish, uh, and he boasted on clay cylinders found at the remains of the ziggurat of Borsippa that he defeated and destroyed it until it was completely annihilated. But those same cylinders go on and they talk about his renovation of a variety of different temples. Even in the Levant, in the Baal cycle, um, Baal defeat, de defeats the sea god Yamu, and then just a little bit later, he receives permission from El, the head of the pantheon, to build his house. And then we're told about the building of his house or temple. The Aramaic Zakur inscription uh, talks about Zakur, king of Hamath and Luash, uh, talking about how he defeated a coalition of 17 Syrian kings before embarking on a building program that included fortifying cities and building shrines and temples. And so the typical ancient Near Eastern pattern was for kings to go to war, to then build temples, and to boast about their victories on the walls of those temples. By striking contrast, the biblical temple conveys none of that. Uh, the biblical temple is or, uh, adorned with floral patterns, palm trees, pomegranates, uh, faunal patterns like lions, cherubim, I'm not sure where those would fall, uh, and then geometrical shapes. Strong, strong contrast between what ancient Near Eastern kings did and what Yahweh does in his temple. I think even more importantly, the rejection of David, Israel's greatest warrior king, as the builder of the temple is a highly significant break with common ancient Near Eastern victorious war king builder themes. And despite Yahweh's sanction of Israel's many battles, David's plan to build Yahweh's temple is rejected in favor of his son Solomon, the man of peace. And the chronicler specifies that it is the much blood spilled and many great wars fought that lie behind Yahweh's rejection of David as temple builder. So 1 Chronicles 22 verse 7 says, uh, and this is David speaking to Solomon, my son, I planned to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and you have waged wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed much blood in, this, uh, in my sight on the earth. And again, uh, Marian teaches this all the time. Repetition is key to what's important. First Chronicles 28 verse 3 says something very similar. Yahweh's astonishing rejection of David is heightened when we consider the otherwise very positive portrait of David in Chronicles. That Israel's warrior king par excellence is not allowed to build the temple for Yahweh due to the blood on his hands breaks away from typical ancient Near Eastern um, celebrations of warfare. 
and it points away from valorizing and celebrating warrior kings. Another place where we catch a glimpse of Yahweh as a reluctant warrior God is in Deuteronomy 17. One of the key areas of difference between Israel and her ancient Near Eastern neighbors lies in the parameters placed on the king's power. While other ancient Near Eastern kings sought to expand and develop their armed forces by acquiring war horses and chariots, the law of the king in Deuteronomy 17 seeks to limit the king's ability to build a powerful army by accumulating war horses. Today's weapons of mass destruction are multi-kiloton nuclear warheads and Moabs, or mother of all bombs. In the ancient world, the weapons of mass destruction were horses and chariots. They were the most desired and feared weapons of war because of their quick strike capability and the increased payload of multiple uh, warriors with multiple weapons on chariots. Deborah O'Daniel Cantrell points out that war horses were so desirable that, quote, the war horse became the ultimate symbol of power in literature, art, and reality in the ancient world. It is precisely in this context that we need to read the law of the king in Deuteronomy 17. While Israel's earthly kings served as commanders in chief of their army, they did not rely on mili- or they were not supposed to rely on military prowess or strength for their chariot forces. Deuteronomy says the king, however, must not acquire great number of horses for himself or to make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. If we put this no horse and chariot picture together with a portrait of the God who does not like David's war killings, we see good evidence that the issue on the table in Scripture is not just about trusting God, though it it is. It's more than that. It's also about the destructive power of warfare and about God's care for human beings. It's about trusting God with less violent means to achieve peace and security in his land. The biblical uh, lament psalms uh, typically express Yahweh's own grief and sorrow, or Israel's own grief and sorrow at the devastating results of warfare And there are times where God himself joins in the expressions of grief. What I found interesting is that there are also oracles where Yahweh cries. And he cries not just for his own people, but for the war damage that is inflicted upon Israel's enemies, such as Moab. Uh, And you can see a couple of examples in Isaiah 16. Uh, Yahweh says, Therefore I weep with the weeping of Jazer for the vines of Sibma. I drench you with my tears. Jeremiah contains a similar set of oracles with similar indications of divine mourning. And I'm not going to read that passage, but the language is very similar. These passages portray a God who does not pleasure in the devastation brought by war. Yahweh cries a river of tears not only for his own people, but for Israel's enemies when they're destroyed by war. So Terence Fretheim summarizes the implications of these passages well when he says that that God is represented as mourning over the fate of non-Israelite people as well as Israelites. That demonstrates the breadth of God's care and concern for sufferers of the world, whoever they might be. Israel has no monopoly on God's empathy, he says. One final example that I want to draw your attention to. The Elisha narratives give us another snapshot of a reluctant war god via a situation in which the typical conventions of war are turned on their heads to avoid the needless needless slaughter of an enemy. The second Kings chapter uh, six verses eight through 23 begins with the Arameans at war with the Israelites and the Arameans attempt to waylay Israel's king numerous times, and numerous times Elisha tips uh, the king off as to where these ambushes are found. And as a result, the king of Aram sends out horses, chariots, 
and a strong force, we read in verse 14, to capture Elisha in the city of Dothan. Since Elijah's servant fears the Aramean force, the prophet comforts him with the, wars, with the words of a typical pre-battle war oracle. Do not fear, he says to him. And then Elisha asks Yahweh to strike the Arameans. And Yahweh does so. The Hebrew verb nakah commonly refers to the killing of enemy soldiers, which is what the audience would expect upon hearing Elisha ask that Yahweh would strike or strike down the Arameans. But Elisha instead asks Yahweh to strike them with a non-lethal bright light or blindness. The weapon of Yahweh is not a physical weapon since it inflicts no permanent damage. Moreover, when Elisha leads the blind and bedazzled Arameans right into the heart of downtown Samaria, the Israelite king eagerly anticipates his opportunity to strike down the Arameans, Naka. But Elisha prohibits him from slaying the defenseless POWs. Do not kill Naka them, he says. Would you kill or would you Naka those that you captured with your own sword? Uh, instead, Elisha ensures the safety of the Arameans. He also invokes a tradition of hospitality and orders the Israelite king to set out a feast before the, Aramean, uh, the captured Arameans. By invoking the traditions of hospitality, whereby guests are granted temporary family status, they re receive protection, food, and even lodging. Mario Liverani notes that when hospitality has been granted, quote, the guest who is in some way assimilated with members of the host household cannot be injured and certainly cannot be killed. At the same time, the protocols of hospitality prohibit guests from harming their hosts. And so the Arameans are thereby transformed from mortal enemies into honored guests while simultaneously ensuring the safety of the Israelites. And as such, this peaceful inversion of typical war practices, particularly in light of the intimation of the superiority of Yahweh's horses and chariots in verse 17, serves as a breakout from typical ancient Near Eastern and biblical war practices. And it represents a highly significant redemptive approach to war hostility. Yahweh's enemies are turned into guests and hostilities are quelled by the use of creative nonviolent tactics. So uh, let me wrap up. Uh, these subversive war passages and others like them don't directly overturn the war ethos of the ancient Near East or ancient Israel. But I think they do push us to ask some significant questions. Why does Yahweh shed tears at the destruction of Israel's enemies? Why does Yahweh strictly forbid the acquiring of ancient world weapons of mass destruction, horses and chariots, when every other ancient Near Eastern power was trying to acquire them? Why does Yahweh refuse to have the greatest Israelite warrior build for him a temple? Why is Yahweh's temple adorned not with martial imagery, but flora, fauna, and geometrical shapes that recall the Garden of Eden? I think these subversive war texts present a portrait of Yahweh as a highly reluctant war god who is not eager to participate with Israel in their wars. These Old Testament texts inform us of a God who, is unex who, a god who unexpectedly subverts the practice of war among his own people. And when taken together, these, this collection of better answers, I think, presents a hopeful and I think redemptive picture of Yahweh and his attitude towards war. War was bloody, brutal, and I suppose I could add barbaric. Uh, the use of hyperbole to describe battle helps us to see that while rhetoric, the rhetoric of the text indicates the total kill of a population, reality seems to have been less than that. And second, while we tend to focus on the total kill language in Deuteronomy and Joshua, the presence of drive-out language supports the contention that there were at least 
two different means to achieve the goal of, of uh, gaining control over the land of Canaan. One means far less violent than the other. And third, the subversive war portraits of Yahweh show a tender-hearted God who grieves the effects of war, not only on his own people, but Israel's enemies. At times, Yahweh even circumvents the devastation of battle through peaceful hospitality and other nonviolent means. And perhaps the most profound and striking statement about Yahweh's attitude to war is made when David's bloody hands are not allowed to build the temple, showing how strongly Yahweh is tilted towards peace. The distancing of Yahweh's name and reputation from the war king David and instead the aligning of his name and reputation with Shalom or Shalomo makes a stunning repudiation of ancient Near Eastern temple building norms and it creates temple distance, a gap of holy proportions between A, how Yahweh would truly want to redeem his, uh, want his redeemed people to act and B, what he was willing at an accommodation level to do with them. Yahweh bears this accommodation mostly in silence during Israel's wars, but not always. We have reviewed some intriguing exceptions. And in these passages, we see hints of the coming day when the brokenhearted, reluctant warrior God will set up his kingdom of Shalom, which one day will do away with war altogether. Thank you.